Well, welcome everybody. This is a presentation on OSF. So for those of you who are participating remotely, um, I because I'm broadcasting on a screen up here, I'm, I can't see the chat, but Josh is gonna watch it for me. And um, so I think what we can, I will um, pause at the end of my introduction for um, questions. Uh, and if any of them show up in the chat from remote people, we'll answer those at that time. All right, so I'm Steve Baskoff with the DISC office, and I'm gonna do the, um, the introduction here. So I'm gonna talk about several things. First of all, um, what is OSF and what are its main features? And then I'm gonna talk about some of the different pieces that um, make up OSF, including um, contributors, components, file sharing. And then I wanna talk about a special important feature of OSF called registrations. Um, which are super cool. And then I'll end by uh, talking a little bit about how OSL helps you to meet some of the new data sh sharing requirements that um, funders like uh, NIH have uh, recently put into place. So the first thing that I wanna say about OSF is despite science being in the name, it's not just a science uh, framework. So it's really a framework that supports all kinds of research, including, but not exclusively, science. Basically, OSF is a safe place to put things where you don't wanna lose them. But it's more than that. It's also a collaboration hub. So as you're archiving your data, you can do this with your, um, your co-researchers. And this is a, a super cool thing about OSF is that when the project is done, it is also a platform for presenting the results. So OSF can be used throughout the research um, cycle in the planning phase, the actual uh, storing of data when you're carrying out the uh, research, and then afterwards when you're making your results available, it, it operates throughout that whole uh, part of the research cycle. So one of the important key features about OSF is that it's free. That's actually uh, pretty amazing and pretty awesome. Um, and how is it free? Well, there's an organization called the Center for Open Science, and which has a mission to increase openness, integrity, and reproducibility um, in research. And that organization is supported by a community that includes uh, financial supporters. And so they have basically a fund set aside with $250,000 that's like a preservation fund. And so they calculated it out according to, you know, like projected costs that um, if they, if the organization stopped operating, they would be able to keep the data that people have uploaded online for more than 50 years. So this is actually pretty impressive in terms of a preservation strategy. Another important feature of OSF that I'll talk about is that it issues digital object identifiers, which is a form of persistent identifier for the different components that you can save as a part of your project. And the other thing which I'll talk about next is that you can control the access to uh, the project um, associating particular participants with particular parts of the project. So as you may have already guessed, the main structural piece of OSF is the project. So when you set up a project, you're basically setting up a, a umbrella under which you're gonna group all the data that are associated with that project. But you can also associate particular people with either the entire project or just particular parts of the project. And those contributors that you associate with your project can have anything ranging from complete administrative privileges to read and write privileges or even uh, read only privileges. So one of the nice features of OSF is that you can um, create what are called components. So the different components of the project allow you to separate out both participants who have access to that particular part of, or that particular component of the project. And also you can associate particular data sources with just that component. So if you have a team of people and 
part of the team is working on one part of the project, you can basically compartmentalize those people and their data there, and they will not necessarily have access unless you give it to them to some other component. Whereas uh, collaborators who are collaborators on the entire project can, um, can access all of the uh, components that are within the project. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the other key feature of OSF is file storage. So obviously if you're using this as a place to keep your data, you have to have some way to do that. So OSF comes built in with five gigabytes of, of storage that OSF provides. So is that a lot? It depends. If, you're, you know, if your project involves primarily numeric data, that's actually quite a lot. If your project involves things like images or video, then it's not gonna be enough. So it really kind of depends on the nature of your project. Um, so if it turns out that you have uh, data that's going to take up more than five gigabytes, then there is a way that you can handle that through uh, uh, file storage add-ons, which I'll talk about a little bit later. There isn't any overall user limit. So the, the five gigabyte limit is per project. So if you have one project that's pushing the five gigabyte limit, you can still open another project and it will have its own five gigabyte limit. Within a project, there is a, uh, you can organize your files in a hierarchical way through like a, a file tree similar to what you do on your own hard drive. And you can access this tree either directly from the, the uh, project landing page or through the files tab. And, and it's like very intuitive in terms of using it. And you'll probably get a chance during the demo to play around with this. But um, if you are... Um, thoughtful in your organization of your files, then it allows you to find where you put your files. But also remember that this is eventually gonna be the presentation system that people who are looking at your work later on are gonna be able to, to use to look at your work. So having an easily navigatable file structure is important for that as well. Now, when you uh, have already uploaded the files, the uh, OSF has really nice preview features. So most of the types of uh, typical types of files like Word documents, Excel, PDFs, and so on um, are human viewable in the viewer. So if you click on uh, a file, it opens up in the viewer and you can basically see what's in it. If it's either structured data or code, it has built in like a uh, tag or syntax highlighting. So it makes it really easy. Like if you're presenting code, for people to follow what's going on in the code. So these kinds of features, both the navigation features as well as the human readable displaying features are really important because as I said, eventually this is how the public is gonna be able to view your work later on. I mentioned storage add-ons. So what can you do if you uh, have more than five gigabytes of data? Um, so you can connect pretty much any of the typical file storage systems that people are used to, things like Box or um, GitHub, Google Drive, OneDrive, all of those uh, typical cloud services, AWS, S3, those can be connected to a particular project and that's how you can get above the storage limits. Now, of course, you are also, if you're using the freed ver free version of these, uh, external storage things, then they have their own limits. But with the paid versions of something like Box or whatever, you, you really don't have limits uh, with respect to the amount of data that you can store in your project. One last thing that I uh, will mention, which is actually kind of cool, is that another form of add-on that you can add is a reference manager add-on. OSF currently supports Mendeley and Zotero unfortunately it does not support EndNote. Um, so it doesn't allow you to manage your references. Um, you have to use your external reference manager to do that, but you are able to view references. So what this means is that OSF is, you, you can use OSF to basically give a complete picture of your research. You can have descriptive documents where you document your, your hypotheses, um, your experimental design, the data you collected, and with the reference managers, you can also 
um, link all the references that are associated with your project as well. So it gives basically a complete picture of your project. So I'm going to um, wrap things up here with talking a little bit about registrations, which is a, a, a really important feature of OSF. So one of the problems that people have, uh, have brought out about a lot of research is lack of transparency about um, the history or the planning of the project. So like one of the bad practices in research is if you collect the data and then decide what you want your hypothesis to be after you um, collected the data, you shouldn't do that, right? You should create the hypothesis first. Use that hypothesis to design your experiment. Collect data according to your experimental design and then go back and analyze the data based on your original hypothesis. Well, how can you be transparent with people and let them know that, yes, I did actually create this hypothesis before I collected the data? You can do that with what is known as a registration. So a registration is basically a snapshot of your project at a particular given time. And once you create that snapshot, you can't edit it or delete it. Um, so it basically keeps you honest about what the status was of your project at a particular time. Now, if you're concerned about getting scooped by uh, creating a registration, like if, you're, if your project is not public yet and you don't want people to see the registration, you can actually embargo them for up to four years um, and make them available whenever you're ready. So the registration itself is assigned a permanent unique uh, URI. So um, it meets the um, persistent identifier criteria. It's also citable immediately if you want to do that. Um, so if you want to, if you if you have preliminary data that you want to make available, you can do that, or you can, of course, as I said, you can embargo it as well. So. Um, so that's another cool feature of OSF. So I'm going to wrap this up by just kind of summarizing um, some of the key requirements that um, data, key data sharing requirements that uh, funders like NIH have. One of them is that your work should be accessible through uh, persistent identifiers, PIDs. In this case, um, the uh, digital object identifiers that are assigned by OSF to your project um, help to meet that requirement. Um, and by its very nature, all the features that I talked about, uh, OSF is fair, that is, makes your data uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, which is another key requirement of funders. And the other thing, and I think this is really the probably the most important thing about OSF is that you don't have to scramble at the end of your project to figure out what you're going to do with your data. Like, you know, you're ready to publish the data and the publisher says like, okay, well, where is your data archived? You don't have to scramble at the last minute because you've been planning on this throughout uh, the entire research cycle. So as soon as you're ready to publish, you can make your, uh, uh, make your project viewable or make a, a registration of it viewable. The other thing is, and this is a thing that I think was freaking some people out about the NIH um, requirements is that you have to not only make your published data available, but your unpublished data as well. So if you're storing all your data in OSF, your unpublished data automatically becomes accessible as well. And so by, by having all of these different pieces, your data, description of your project, your protocols, your references in a single place, it basically means when the project's done, click a button uh, to make it public and, you're, and you've met all these requirements without having to scramble at the last minute. So uh, that is my introduction. And um, at this point, um, if you have any questions, I'll answer those briefly. Anything come up in the chat? Okay, the question was, can you connect Acre to OSF? Um, I do not know the answer to that, but I'm gonna guess the answer is probably no, because of, uh, I mean, there's probably a, like a web hook or an integration or whatever that is set up with these uh, different 
um, well-known providers. So, I mean, if Acre had like a webhook set up to support this, then you could probably do it. But um, to, to my knowledge, it's not like on the list of, of that. So um, yeah, that's a great question. Any other questions? Okay, well, at this point, I'm gonna turn things over uh, to Alex and Josh, and I'll let them introduce themselves. And they have a, um, an exercise that they want you to, uh, a, a page they want you to load. So that's the tiny URL. Okay, so this is what OSF looks like. Um, so when you first go there, that the link to OSF is also in the chat, but I recommend that you just watch first uh, and then the exercise will help you learn how to use this tool. So first things first, uh, you're gonna want to go into the upper right and uh, click sign in. So uh, just out of curiosity, do any of you have an ORCID account? ORCID, ORCID, okay, good. Uh, hopefully uh, I can't see folks in the in the chat, but if you don't have an ORCID account, I recommend you sign up for one because uh, then you can use that to sign into OSF. Uh, it makes it a lot easier. Just do it with a couple clicks and then you're in. Okay, and so uh, this is what you're gonna see when you first open OSF. This is a dashboard. I happen to have lots of projects here and you can search through each of your individual projects. Um, you can create a new project. And one of the key things you're gonna to wanna to set up first though is your account. So you're gonna see your account with your avatar set up here. And I recommend going over to uh, my profile here. And there's a few things that you can do here. You can uh, connect to your ORCID, GitHub, LinkedIn, Google Scholar, ResearchGate, academia.org. You can see all of your public projects here in the list and any public components as well. Um, and you can edit your profile here um, in the upper right. And with this, you can change your uh, information, uh, your name, attach social media to your account. You can add employment information, education level. And one of the more important things is you can configure your add-on accounts. So over here is a list of the accounts uh, that I have connected to um, OSF. And so here you can see the apps that work with OSF. Here we have Amazon S3, Bitbucket, Box, Dataverse, Dropbox, Big Share, GitHub, GitLab, Google Drive, Mendeley, OneDrive, OwnCloud, and Zotero. So there's a lot of apps which uh, allow you to store data and link up to GitHub. And you can set those up here by clicking connect or authorize account. And then you just sign in and pick whatever uh, you know folder you want to connect to whatever individual project you're going to be looking at. Okay, so that is what your profile looks like. Okay, so now uh, if we want to actually go to an individual project, then what we can do is go back to the uh, home page where we see the list, the dashboard, uh, and then we can click on one of these projects. So I happen to have a project set up for this account. You're going to be building the same type of project later on. I'll use that as an example. To give you a real world example, I'll give you. Uh, a data set also that we have shared with a published paper. Uh, so I'll show you that first. So if you just click on uh, here, when you create an account, uh, it will take you directly to your project. And so this is kind of what the, uh, the page typically looks like for an OSF uh, repository. You're gonna have in the top, the title, which you can click on and edit very easily at any time and just click the green check mark to edit it. You can also uh, add a description here, which you just click on the description and click the green check mark to edit it. You can see a list of who is working on the project with you and click on their names to see their individual accounts. Uh, in this case, this project is public, so I have a DOI. Uh, and then the main things on this page that are important are a wiki, which kind of is the text that describes what your repository contains. And then all the files included in this individual project are below that. And then up here in the upper right, 
you can see how this would be cited, your individual repository. And then you can see the connected components here, as well as linked projects. So a component is a subset of a project which can't be moved away from that project. And a linked project is a project somewhere else that is somehow related to this one that you want to appear on the same page. So linked projects can be disconnected, components cannot. That is the primary difference. And then you can see tags associated with the project that makes things searchable. And then any anytime you change anything or any of your colleagues working on the project change anything, it will appear here in the recent activity. So uh, you can see exactly up to date what's happening in your individual project. Now there's a few important things I want to note. So if we go to the wiki page, you click this little uh, box in the upper right where it says wiki here, and this will open up the wiki. And then if you go to the upper right here and click edit, you'll see what the actual behind, uh, uh, behind the curtain code looks like. So this particular um, interface uses markdown language. Now, if you just Google markdown basics, you'll get an idea of how to make it look nice like this. But to summarize, uh, a hashtag gives you a title, a couple hashtag gives you a subtitle. Uh, you can add links and it will automatically find them. Uh, a double set of asterisks surrounding words will make it bold. An asterisk with a space will give you bullet points. And so you can organize things, describe files, describe variables, whatever you need in here. And then all you have to do is click save and then it saves your wiki. You can also, so this is just the home wiki. But you can add other wikis. In the upper left here, you see new. So you could add different wikis describing different files, uh, different subsets of the data on your repository by adding different pages here. Okay. And so you can always go back by going to the upper left and clicking the title here, and it will take you back to the main page. Now, dealing with the files, what you automatically get when you open up an account is the OSF storage. This is where all your files are gonna appear automatically. So if you want to add files or folders, you have to click on this, okay? And then you can see options like create folder, and that will allow you to create folders. And then you can just drag and drop things into the individual folder, which you can open up here. Uh, and things within here, you can drag and drop and move around quite easily. Uh, you can download all the data as a zip file, can upload new data. If you click on an individual file, you can download it, you can view it, you can check it out, which means that you can look at and manipulate it and no one else can change it, or you can rename it. Okay. And if you go to a file and you double click on it or click on the name, it will open up the viewer for that file. So in this case, this is a docx file. So I hope that this preview will work. Sometimes I have trouble with it uh, appearing in the preview window. But well, while that's loading, uh, you can see that you can download this individual file and you can see the metadata associated with it. You can even edit the metadata straight on this file here. You can change title, descriptions, resource types, et cetera. And you can even see the versions. So. You can see revisions of the file. So this case, this is the original, but if you ever change a file or re-upload a file with the same name or make edits, you'll see a list here and the time that these edits took place and you can click on it and you'll get that file back. You can also add uh, tags to a file to make it easier to find. To add a component to a project, so that's dealing with files, to add a component to a project, all that you have to do is click add component, and then you can enter a title up here. And one of the cool things that you can do here is take all of the people associated with this project. So here it gives you the option add contributors, and you can add tags on this uh, particular project to the component itself, and it will port all of that information over for you. 
uh, and you can add a description and you can categorize it in one of these ways. These categorizations are just for your own edification. They don't change anything about the project. Okay, so that's how you create a component. Adding tags is quite easy. You just click here, type in a name, hit enter, and it will add a tag. Uh, how you access some of the uh, other information um, is up at the top here. So if you wanna edit the metadata, there's the metadata option at the top. We click there. We can see that we can uh, edit the description, the contributors, we can add funding information if we want, affiliate institutions, um, resource information right here. So this is a key tool that you're going to be using uh, to align with the OSTP memos requirements about metadata. And this is kind of the hub where you will work on that. And then uh, over here, you can add contributors. So this is another key aspect of uh, a useful thing um, within OSF. If we click on the contrib contributors tag, uh, you can control who has access to what, okay? So you can, at, up at the top with this green add button, click add, and you can search for someone else's OSF account here. So I'll just, for the sake of example, search for my colleague, even though he's already on this project, his name will appear here. And all that you have to do is click the plus sign, and then uh, you can decide which parts of the project you want uh, him or her to have access to and which components. And then you can decide if you want this person to be an administrator here, have read write access or just be able to read the project. So administrators can do things like delete the whole project, read and write, uh, allows you to uh, upload files um, and, and read what's available. And read just means they can't change anything themselves. They can see what's there and download it. And then down here, view only links. So this is something that you can share with someone before you want your project to be uh, available. Um, allows you to uh, you know, do things like anonymize the link, anonymize the names of contributors and share projects with, with people who you just want to be able to see it, but not manipulate it. Um, and you don't wanna to have to make it public either. Okay, so another key tool here are add-ons, the add-ons are up at the top. If you click here, this is how you, once you've configured um, things in your profile and connected uh, your individual um, accounts for these add-ons to your profile, you can then add them to an individual project. So here I have Mendeley added. If I wanted to, just for the sake of example, add Google Drive, I'll select that and click enable, confirm, and then Google Drive will appear here and I pick import account from profile, import. And then I select whichever folder I so desire. Okay. And then when you select that, that will appear on your profile automatically. Do contributors need to have an OSF account in order to be added to the project? Yes, yes, they do. Only only people with OSF accounts can be added. Um, so yes, if you want someone to be able to see your project, but don't want to have them as a contributor, then the view only link is the best option for someone who does not have an OSF account. So that is just, again, down here, view only links. That would be good for like paper reviews or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for people who want to, you know, take a look at your data, but you don't necessarily want them to know who you are, um, or, you know, students in a class who you want to be able to download files, but not necessarily manipulate those files. Yeah. Actually, I have a question before you stop the recording. This is Michelle Southard Smith. So when, you know, you have a DOI for your data set, then do you reference that DOI in your manuscript for if it's like a published thing? I mean, you yeah. know, kind of, could you kind of clarify the the laddering of the DOIs? How's that going to work? Which DOI is going to supersede, right? Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, let me let me share my screen here. 
So yes, the DOI uh, appears here. Uh, that's actually that actually brings up a good point. Okay. So right now this project is public. Okay. Uh, so up here, if this pub if this project was private, there would be a button that says um, Make Public, and you could click on that button and it would open up the project for everyone to see. And then you could just share this link in the URL for everyone to be able to see it. And then uh, up at the top, you would see uh, enable DOI available here. And all you have to do is click enable DOI, and then the project will be assigned a DOI like this. And so you can just take this number, copy paste it, and you can cite that directly. You can see in the citation, it appears in all the citations right here. So this DOI will be the one you'll use to share data for any project or paper. Uh, yes, you can make DOIs for individual components. Uh, you can make DOIs for individual uh, you know, aspects of your project. Great, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, one, yeah, one other thing I will mention that's uh, also interesting is in the upper right here, you see this little symbol. This is called a uh, fork. So you don't have to make a whole template like this. If you see someone else's project and it looks like how you want it to look, you can click this uh, fork button and you can uh, take their template essentially and use it for your project and then edit it. Um, and you can also just duplicate it, copy it, the difference between a fork is that a fork will track how many people have copied a project and a duplicate will just copy it without uh, anyone being able to see uh, who has copied it. So it's kind of useful data for tracking things. 